Welcome to Frig Friday, featuring Sigrid Unset's Kristen Lovren's Daughter, read by Michelle Hammond, sponsored by Gal's Guide. Kristen Lovren's Daughter by Sigrid Unset Winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature Book One, The Wreath Part Three, Lavrens Bjorgolfsson Chapter Seven As she tested the lukewarm brew in the vats, Ronfred said, I think it's cool enough that we can put in the yeast. Kristen had been sitting inside the brew house door, spinning, while she waited for the liquid to cool. She set the spindle on the doorstep, unwrapped the blanket from around the bucket with the dissolved yeast, and measured out a portion. Shut the door first, said her mother, so there won't be any draft. You're acting as if you're asleep, Kristen, she added, annoyed. Kristen slowly poured the yeast into the brewing vats as Ronfred stirred. Geierhild Dreve's daughter invoked the name of Hutt, but it was Odin who came and helped her with the brewing. In return, he demanded what was between her and the vat. This was a saga that Lavrens had once told Kristen when she was little. What was between her and the vat? Kristen felt ill and dizzy from the heat and the sweet, spicy steam in the dark, close brew house. Out in the courtyard, Romborg was dancing in a circle with a group of children and singing, The eagle sits in the highest hall, flexing his golden claw. Kristen followed her mother out to the little entryway, which was filled with empty ale kegs and all kinds of implements. From there, a door led out to a strip of ground between the back wall of the brew house and the fence surrounding the barley field. A swarm of pigs jostled each other, biting and squealing as they fought over the tepid, discarded mash. Kristen shaded her eyes with her hand from the glaring noonday sun. Her mother glanced at the scuffling pigs and said, We won't be able to get by with fewer than eighteen reindeer. Do you think we'll need so many? asked her daughter, distracted. Yes, we must serve game with the pork each day, replied her mother and we'll only have enough fowl and hare to serve the guests in the high loft. You must remember that close to two hundred people will be coming here, with their servants and children, and the poor must be fed as well. And even though you and Erland will leave on the fifth day, some of the guests will no doubt stay on for the rest of the week, at least. Stay here and tend to the ale, Kristen, said Ronfred. I have to go and cook dinner for your father and the haymakers. Kristen went to get her spinning and then sat down in the back doorway. She tucked the distaff with the wool under her arm, but her hand sank into her lap, holding the spindle. Beyond the fence, the tips of the barley glinted like silver and silk in the sun. Above the rush of the river, she heard now and then the sound of the scythes in the meadows out on the islet. Occasionally, the iron would strike against stone. Her father and the servants were working hard to put the worst of the mowing season behind them. There was so much to do for her wedding. The smell of the tepid mash and the rank breath of the pigs, she suddenly felt nauseated again, and the noontime heat made her so faint and weak. White-faced, her spine rigid, she sat there waiting for the sensation to pass. She didn't want to be sick again. She had never felt this way before. It would do no good for her to try to console herself with the thought that it wasn't yet certain that she might be mistaken. What was between her and the vat? Eighteen reindeer, close to two hundred wedding guests. People would have something to laugh about then when they heard that all the commotion was for the sake of a pregnant woman who had to be married off in time. Oh no. She tossed aside her spinning and leaped to her feet, 
With her forehead pressed against the wall of the brew house, she vomited into the thicket of nettles that grew in abundance there. Brown caterpillars were swarming over the nettles. The sight of them made her feel even sicker. Kristen rubbed her temples, wet with sweat. Oh no, surely that was enough. They were going to be married on the second Sunday after Michaelmas, and then their wedding would be celebrated for five days. That was more than two months away. By then, her mother and the other women of the village would be able to see it. They were always so wise about such matters. They could always tell when a woman was with child months before Kristen could see how they knew. Poor thing, she has grown so pale. Impatiently, Kristen rubbed her hands against her cheeks, for she could feel that they were wan and bloodless. In the past, she had so often thought that this was bound to happen one day, and she had not been terribly afraid of it. But it wouldn't have been the same back then, when they could not and would not be allowed to marry in the proper fashion. It was considered, yes, it was thought to be shameful in many ways, and a sin too. But if it was a matter of two young people who refused to be forced from each other, that was something everyone would remember and they would speak of the two with compassion. She would not have been ashamed. But when it happened to those who were betrothed, then everyone merely laughed and teased them mercilessly. She realized herself that it was laughable. Here they were brewing ale and making wine, slaughtering and baking and cooking for a wedding that would be talked about far and wide, and she, the bride, felt ill at the mere smell of food and crept behind the outbuildings in a cold sweat to throw up. Erland. She clenched her teeth in anger. He should have spared her this. She had not been willing. He should have remembered how it had been before, when everything had been uncertain for her, when she had had nothing to hold on to except his love. Then she had always, always gladly yielded to his wishes. He should have left her alone this time, when she tried to refuse because she thought it improper for them to steal something in secret after her father had placed their hands together in the sight of all their kinsmen. But he had taken her, partly by force, but with laughter and with caresses too, so she had been unable to show him that she was serious in her refusal. Kristen went inside to tend to the ale, and then came back and stood leaning over the fence. The grain swayed faintly, glinting in the light breeze. She couldn't ever remember seeing the crops so dense and lush as this year. She caught a glimpse of the river in the distance, and she heard her father's voice shouting. She couldn't distinguish his words, but the workers out on the islet were laughing. What if she went to her father and told him? It would be better to forego all this trouble. To marry her to Erland quietly, without a church wedding and grand feast, now that it was a matter of her acquiring a wife's name before it became apparent to everyone that she was already carrying Erland's child. Erland would be ridiculed too, just as much as she would be, or more. He was not a young boy, after all. But he was the one who wanted this wedding. He wanted to see her as a bride wearing silk and velvet and a high golden crown. He wanted that but he also wanted to possess her during all those sweet secret hours. She had acquiesced to everything. She would continue to do as he wanted in this matter, too. And in the end, no doubt, he would realize that no one could have both. He who had talked of the great Christmas celebration he would hold at Husaby during the first year she was his wife on the manor, then he would show all his kinsmen and friends and the people of the villages far and wide what a beautiful wife he had won. Kristen smiled spitefully. Christmas this year would hardly be a fitting occasion for that. It would happen around St. Gregor's Day. Her thoughts seemed to swirl in her head whenever she told herself that sometime close to St. Gregor's Day she would give birth to a child. She was a little frightened by it, too. She remembered her mother's shrill screams, which had rung out over the farm for two days when Ulfield had come into the world. Over at Ulfsvold, two young women had died 
one after the other in childbirth, and Sigurd of Lopsgard's first two wives had died too, and her own grandmother for whom she was named. But fear was not what she felt most. These past years, when she realized again that she was still not pregnant, she had thought that perhaps this was to be their punishment, hers and Erlon's, that she would continue to be barren. They would wait and wait in vain for what they had feared before. They would hope so futilely, just as they had feared so needlessly, until at last they would realize that one day they would be carried out from his ancestral estate and vanish. His brother was a priest, after all, and the children that Erlond already had could never inherit from him. Munon the Stump and his sons would come in and take their place, and Erlond would be erased from the lineage. She pressed her hand hard against her womb. It was there, between her and the fence, between her and the vat, between her and the whole world, Erlon's legitimate son. She had tried everything she had heard Fru Ashild once speak of, with blood from her right and left arm. She was carrying a son, whatever fate he might bring her. She remembered her brothers who had died and her parents' sorrowful faces whenever they mentioned them. She remembered all those times when she had seen them despair over Ulfield and the night she had died. And she thought about all the sorrow she herself had caused them, and about her father's careworn face. And yet this was not the end of the grief she would bring her father and mother. And yet, and yet... Kristen rested her head on her arm lying along the fence. The other hand she kept pressed against her womb. Even if this brought her new sorrows, even if it caused her own death, she would still rather die giving Erland a son than have both of them die some day, with the buildings standing empty and with the grain in their fields swaying for strangers. Someone came into the front room. The ale, thought Kristen. I should have looked at it long ago. She straightened up, and then Erlon stooped as he came out of the doorway and stepped forward into the sunlight, beaming with joy. So this is where you are, he said. And you don't even take a step to meet me, he asked. He came over and embraced her. Beloved, have you come to visit? she asked, astonished. He must have just dismounted from his horse. He still had his cape over his shoulders and his sword at his side. He was unshaven, filthy, and covered with dust. He was wearing a red surcoat, which draped from the neckline, and was slit up the sides almost to his arms. As they went through the brew house and across the courtyard, his clothes fluttered around him so that his thighs were visible clear up to his waist. It was odd. She had never noticed before that he walked slightly crooked. Before she had only seen that he had long, slender legs and narrow ankles and small, well-shaped feet. Erland had brought a full escort along with him, five men and four spare horses. He told Ronfred that he had come to get Kristen's household goods. Wouldn't it be a comfort for her to find her things at Husaby when she arrived? And since the wedding was to take place so late in the fall, it might be more difficult to transport everything then. And wouldn't it be more likely to suffer damage from seawater on the ship? The abbot at Niederholm had offered to send everything now with the Laurentius Cloister ship. They expected to set sail from Vieux around Assumption Day. That was why he had come to convey her things through Romstall to the headland. He sat in the doorway to the cookhouse and drank ale and talked while Ronfred and Kristen plucked the wild ducks that Lovrens had brought home the day before. The mother and daughter were alone at home. The women servants were all out in the meadows, raking. He looked so happy. He was so pleased with himself for coming on such a sensible errand. Her mother left, and Kristen tended to the birds on the spit. Through the open door she caught a glimpse of Erlon's men lying in the shade across the courtyard, passing the basin of ale among them. He sat on the stoop, chatting and laughing, 
The sun shone brightly on his bare, soot-black hair. She noticed that there were several gray streaks in it. Well, he would soon be thirty-two, after all. But he acted like a brash young man. She knew that she wouldn't tell him about her trouble. There would be time enough for that when he realized it himself. A good-humored tenderness coursed through her heart, over the hard little anger that lay at the bottom, like a glittering river over stones. She loved him more than anything. It filled her heart, even though she always saw and remembered everything else. How out of place this courtier seemed amid the busy farm work, wearing his elegant red surcoat, silver spurs on his feet, and a belt studded with gold. She also noticed that her father didn't come up to the farm, even though her mother had sent Romborg down to the river with word of the guest who had arrived. Erland came over to Kristen and put his hands on her shoulders. Can you believe it? he said, his face radiant. Doesn't it seem strange to you that all these preparations are being made for our wedding? Kristen gave him a kiss and pushed him aside. She poured fat over the birds and told him not to get in her way. No, she wouldn't tell him. Lovrens didn't come up to the farm until the haymakers did, around supper time. He wasn't dressed much differently from the workmen, in an undyed knee-length homespun tunic and ankle-length leggings of the same fabric. He was barefoot and carried his scythe over his shoulder. The only thing that distinguished his attire from that of the servants was a shoulder collar of leather for the hawk that was perched on his left shoulder. He was holding Romborg's hand. Lovrens greeted his son-in-law heartily enough and asked his forgiveness for not coming earlier. They had to push as hard as they could to get the farm work done because he had to make a journey into town between the haying season and the harvest. But when Erland presented the reason for his visit at the supper table, Lovrens became quite cross. It was impossible for him to do without any of his wagons or horses right now. Erland replied that he had brought along four extra horses himself. Lovrens thought there would be at least three cartloads. Besides, the maiden would have to keep all her clothing at Jurengard, and the bed linen that Kristen would be taking with her would be needed at the farm during the wedding for all the guests they would have to house. Never mind, said Erland. Surely they would find a way to transport everything in the fall. But he had been so pleased, and he thought it sounded so sensible, when the abbot had suggested that Kristen's things might travel with the monastery ship. The abbot had reminded him of their kinship. That's something they're all remembering now, said Erland with a smile. His father-in-law's disapproval did not seem to affect him in the least. And so it was decided that Erland should borrow a wagon and take a cartload of those things that Kristen would need most when she arrived at her new home. The next day they were busy with the packing. Ronfred thought that both the large and the small looms could be sent along now. She wouldn't have time to weave anything else before the wedding. The mother and daughter cut off the weaving that was on the loom. It was an undyed homespun fabric, but of the finest and softest wool, with tufts of black wool woven in to form a pattern. Kristen and her mother rolled up the cloth and placed it in a leather bag. Kristen thought it would be good for swaddling clothes, and it would be pretty with red or blue ribbons around it. The sewing chest that Arna had once made for her could also go along. Kristen took from her box all the things that Erland had given her over time. She showed her mother the blue velvet cape with the red pattern that she was going to wear in the bridal procession. Her mother turned it this way and that, feeling the fabric and the fur lining. This is a most costly cloak said Ronfred. When did Erland give this to you? He gave it to me while I was at Nonacetter, her daughter told her. Kristen's bridal chest, which her mother had been adding to ever since she was little, was repacked. It was carved in panels, and on each there was a leaping deer or a bird sitting amidst the foliage. Ronfred placed Kristen's bridal gown in one of her own chests. It was not quite done, they had been sewing on it all winter long. It was made of scarlet silk and cut in such a fashion that it would fit snugly to her body. 
Kristen thought that now it would be much too tight across her breasts. Toward evening, the load was all packed and tied under the wagon's cover. Erland would leave early the next morning. He stood with Kristen, leaning over the farm gate, looking north, where the bluish-black smudge of a storm cloud filled the valley. Thunder rumbled from the mountains, but to the south the meadows and the river lay in dazzling yellow sunlight. Do you remember the storm on that day in the forest near Gerderud? he asked softly, playing with her fingers. Kristen nodded and tried to smile. The air was so heavy and sultry. Her head was aching, and she was sweating with every breath she took. Lovrens came over to them at the gate and talked about the weather. It seldom did any harm down here in the village, but God only knew whether it would bring trouble to the cattle and horses up in the mountains. It was as black as night up behind the church on the hill. A flash of lightning revealed a group of horses crowding together restlessly on the meadow outside the church gate. Lovrens didn't think they belonged there in the valley. The horses were more likely from Dovre and had been wandering the mountains up beneath Yetta. He shouted over the thunder that he had a mind to go up and see to them, to find out whether there were any of his among them. A terrible bolt of lightning ripped through the darkness up there. Thunder crashed and roared so they could hear nothing else. The horses raced across the grass beneath the ridge. All three of them crossed themselves. Then more lightning flashed. The sky seemed about to split in half, and a tremendous snow-white bolt of lightning hurtled down toward them. All three were thrown against each other. They stood there with their eyes closed, blinded, and noticed a smell like scorched stone, and then the crash of thunder exploded in their ears. St. Olaf, help us! murmured Lovrens. Look at the birch! Look at the birch! cried Erland. The huge birch out in the field seemed to wobble, and then a heavy limb broke off and dropped to the ground, leaving a long gash in the trunk. I think it's burning. Jesus Christus! The church roof is on fire! shouted Lovrens. They stood there and stared. No. Yes, it was! Red flames were flickering out of the shingles beneath the ridge turret. Both men set off running, back across the farmyard. Lovrens tore open all the doors to the buildings, yelling to those inside. Everyone came rushing out. Bring axes! Bring axes! The felling axes! he shouted. And the pickaxes! He raced over to the stables. A moment later he re-emerged, leading Goldsvine by his mane. He leaped up onto the unsaddled horse and tore off toward the north. He had the big broadaxe in his hand. Erland rode right behind him and all the other men followed. Some were on horseback, but others couldn't control the frightened animals and gave up and set off running. Behind them came Ronfred and the women of the farm with basins and buckets. No one seemed to notice the storm any longer. In the flash of the lightning, they saw people come streaming from the buildings farther down in the village. Sir Eirik was already running up the hill, followed by his servants. Horse hooves thundered down the bridge below, and several farmhands raced past. They all turned their pale, terrified faces toward the burning church. A light wind was blowing from the southeast. The fire was firmly entrenched in the north wall. On the west side, the entrance was already blocked, but it had not yet seized the south side or the apse. Kristen and the women from Jurengard entered the churchyard south of the church at a place where the gate had collapsed. The tremendous red blaze lit up the grove north of the church and the area where posts had been erected for tying up the horses. No one could approach the spot because of the heat. Only the cross stood there, bathed in the glow of the flames. It looked as if it were alive and moving. Through the roaring and seething of the fire, they could hear the crash of axes against the staves of the south wall. There were men on the gallery, slashing and chopping, while others tried to tear down the gallery itself. Someone shouted to the women from Jurengard that Lovrens and a few other men had followed Sarah Eirik into the church. They had to break an opening in the wall 
Little tongues of fire were playing here and there among the shingles on the roof. If the wind changed or died down altogether, the flames would engulf the whole church. Any thought of extinguishing the blaze was futile. There was no time to form a chain down to the river, but at Ronfred's command, the women took up positions and passed water from the small creek running along the road to the west. At least there was a little water to throw on the south wall and on the men who were toiling there. Many of the women were sobbing as they worked, out of fear and anguish for those who had gone inside the burning building, and out of sorrow for their church. Kristen stood at the very front of the line of women, throwing the water from the buckets. She stared breathlessly at the church, where they had both gone inside, her father and Erland. The posts of the gallery had been torn down and lay in a heap of wood amid pieces of shingle from the gallery's roof. The men were chopping at the stave wall with all their might. A whole group had lifted up a timber and was using it as a battering ram. Erland and one of his men came out of the small south door of the choir. They were carrying between them the large chest from the sacristy, the chest that Eirik usually sat on when he heard confession. Erland and the servant tipped the chest out into the churchyard. Kristen didn't hear what he shouted. He ran back up into the gallery again. He was as lithe as a cat as he dashed along. He had thrown off his outer garments and was dressed only in his shirt, pants, and hose. The others took up his cry. The sacristy and choir were burning. No one could go from the nave up to the south door anymore. The fire was now blocking both exits. A couple of staves in the wall had been splintered, and Erland had picked up a fire axe and was slashing and hacking at the wreckage of the staves. They had smashed a hole in the side of the church while other people were shouting for them to watch out. The roof might collapse and bury them all inside the church. The shingled roof was now burning briskly on this side, too, and the heat was becoming unbearable. Erland leaped through the hole and helped to bring Sarah Eirik out. The priest had his robes full of holy vessels from the altars. A young boy followed with his hand over his face and the tall processional cross held out in front of him. Lovrens came next. He had closed his eyes against the smoke, staggering under the heavy crucifix he held in his arms. It was much taller than he was. People ran forward and helped them move down to the churchyard. Sira Eirik stumbled, fell to his knees, and the altar vessels rolled across the slope. The silver dove opened, and the host fell out. The priest picked it up, brushed it off, and kissed it as he sobbed loudly. He kissed the gilded man's head, which had stood above the altar with a scrap of St. Olaf's hair and nails inside. Lovrens Bjorgelsen was still standing there, holding the crucifix. His arm lay across the arms of the cross, and he was leaning his head on the shoulder of Christ. It looked as if the Savior were bending his beautiful, sad face toward the man to console him. The roof had begun to collapse bit by bit on the north side of the church. A blazing roof beam shot out and struck the great bell in the low tower near the churchyard gate. The bell rang with a deep, mournful tone, which faded into a long moan, drowned out by the roar of the fire. No one paid any attention to the weather during all the tumult. The whole event had not taken much time, but no one was aware of that either. Now the thunder and lightning were far away to the south of the valley. The rain, which had been falling for a while, was now coming down harder, and the wind had ceased. But suddenly it was as if a sail of flames had been hoisted up from the foundation. In a flash, and with a shriek, the fire engulfed the church from one end to the other. Everyone dashed away from the consuming heat. Erland was suddenly at Kristen's side and urging her down the hill. His body reeked with the stench of the fire. She pulled away a handful of singed hair when she stroked his head and face. They couldn't hear each other's voices above the roaring of the flames, but she saw that his eyebrows had been scorched right off. He had burns on his face, and his shirt was burned in places too. He laughed as he pulled her along after the others.
Everyone followed behind the weeping old priest and Lovrens Björgolfsson carrying the crucifix. At the edge of the churchyard, Lovrens leaned the cross against a tree and then sank down onto the wreckage of the gate. Sarah Eirik was already sitting there. He stretched out his arms toward the burning church. Farewell. Farewell, Olaf's church. God bless you, my Olaf's church. God bless you for every hour I have spent inside you, singing and saying the Mass. Olaf's church, good night. Good night. Everyone from the parish wept loudly along with him. The rain was pouring down on the people, huddled together, but no one thought of leaving. It didn't look as if the rain were damping the heat in the charred timbers. Fiery pieces of wood and smoldering shingles were flying everywhere. A moment later, the ridge turret fell into the blaze with a shower of sparks rising up behind it. Lovren sat with one hand covering his face. His other arm lay across his lap, and Kristen saw that his sleeve was bloody from the shoulder all the way down. Blood was running along his fingers. She went over and touched his arm. I don't think it's serious. Something fell on my shoulder, he said, looking up. He was so pale that even his lips were white. Ulfield, he whispered with anguish as he gazed at the inferno. Sarah Eirik heard him and placed a hand on his shoulder. It will not wake your child, Lovrens. She will sleep just as soundly with the fire burning over her resting place, he said. She has not lost the home of her soul, as the rest of us have this evening. Kristen hid her face against Erlon's chest. She stood there feeling his arms around her. Then she heard her father ask for his wife. Someone said that out of terror, a woman had started having labor pains. They had carried her down to the parsonage, and Ronfred had gone along. Kristen was suddenly reminded of what she had completely forgotten ever since they realized that the church was on fire. She shouldn't have looked at it. There was a man south of the village who had a red splotch covering half his face. They said he was born that way because his mother had looked at a fire while she was carrying him. Dear Holy Virgin Mary, she prayed in silence, don't let my unborn child be harmed by this. The next day, a village thing was to be convened on the church hillside. The people would decide on how to rebuild the church. Kristen sought out Sarah Eirik up at Roman Guard before he left for the thing. She asked the priest whether he thought she should take this as an omen. Perhaps it was God's will that she should tell her father she was unworthy to stand beneath the bridal crown, and that it would be more fitting for her to be married to Erland Nikolausen without a wedding feast. But Sarah Eirik flew into a rage, his eyes flashing with fury. Do you think God cares so much about the way you sluts surrender and throw yourselves away that he would burn down a beautiful and honorable church for your sake? Rid yourself of your pride and do not cause your mother and Lovrens a sorrow from which they would scarcely recover. If you do not wear the crown with honor on your wedding day, it will be bad enough for you. But you and Erland are in even greater need of this sacrament as you are joined together. Everyone has his sins to answer for. No doubt that is why this misfortune has been brought upon us all. Try to better your life and help us to rebuild this church, both you and Erland. Kristen thought to herself that she had not yet told him of the latest thing that had befallen her, but she decided to let it be. She went to the ding with the men. Lovrens attended with his arm in a sling, and Erland had numerous burns on his face. He looked so ghastly, but he only laughed. None of the wounds was serious, and he said that he hoped they wouldn't disfigure him on his wedding day. He stood up after Lovrens and promised to give to the church four marks of silver, and to the village, on behalf of his betrothed, and with Lovrens' consent, a section of Kristen's property worth one mark in land tax. Erland had to stay at Jurengard for a week because of his wounds. Kristen saw that Lovren seemed to like his son-in-law better after the night of the fire. 
The men now seemed to be quite good friends. Then she thought that perhaps her father might be so pleased with Erlan Niklausen that he would be more forbearing and not take it as hard as she had feared when one day he realized that they had sinned against him.